More than 400 years ago, the English poet John Donne declared the essential brotherhood of man and interconnectedness of life when he declaimed that no man is an island entire of itself. Societies do not live in isolation, just as they are linked by ties of friendship, solidarity and affected by ideas that travel. They are also subject to economic and military pressures in their competition with one another. Failing to compete effectively, societies risk occupation, defeat or destruction. Through these competitive pressures, states and societies will gradually be forced to emulate innovations from each other and gradually become more alike or suffer the consequences of inadaptation. The American political scientist Kenneth Waltz has called this the sameness effect, brought about by competitive anarchical system which forcefully socializes its members. Failing to adapt is costly. These pressures are structurally determined and have always existed. Indeed, for many years Muslim and Arab states and societies were powerful actors and competed successfully in that global system. But since the advent of modernity in the late 18th century, they have found it hard to adapt. Ever since Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798 marked the decisive end of Arab and Islamic grandeur, most important decisions affecting Arab and Muslim lives have been taken by outsiders. This inability to adapt to externally imposed change is the primary reason for the Arab world's current paroxysm of instability and violence. The 18th century Irish conservative political commentator Edmund Burke saw the origin of the French Revolution in the inability of the Ancien Regime to adapt to changing social and economic realities and the legitimate popular demands, dooming the monarchic state. He wrote, a state without the means of some change is without the means of its conservation. It is their inability to adapt that has rendered Arab states often passive objects and accounts, in the words of the Egyptian economist Fauzi Mansour, for the exit of the Arabs from history. Faisal Daraj, the Palestinian intellectuals, refers to the tyranny of inherited habits, which leads to the renewal of the defeats under different social authoritarian conditions and the reproduction of the relations of backwardness in a renewed form, which allows for serial defeats that expel the Arabs from history. Referring to the book by Halim Barakat, Alienation and Arab Culture, Daraj then goes on to draw a remarkably depressing juxtaposition of Western and Arab life. He writes, There is no Arab authority capable of renewing itself after it has settled into a state of scandalous exceptionalism and the absolute fatalism that has triumphed at the populist level is not concerned with earthly matters. The final reminder in both cases is an oriental particularism which gives to one human side tyranny, corruption, weakness, ignorance and immiseration and the other side democracy, science, technical knowledge, the rule of law and the rights of citizenship. Daraj, like Al-Azam and myself, sees modernity despite its evident costs and its inevitability as ultimately a positive phenomenon, due to its unbelievable dynamism, its promise of liberation and simultaneous destruction of old certainties but also restrictions. Still, there are two critiques to our approach towards modernity, to its evocative promise just outlined by Daraj that I should briefly touch upon, namely the possibility of objectively measuring governance and the related but distinct question of cultural relativism. Daraj and Al-Azm are explicitly asking their Arab readers to accept and take responsibility for a state of affairs that is unflattering to the Arab psyche. Negative information that contradicts the often idealized way we see ourselves creates painful emotions and inner conflict. The term psychologists use to describe this phenomenon is cognitive dissonance. It refers to the mental discomfort experienced by a person who 
who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas or values. It is stressful having to act in contradiction to these pre-existing beliefs, ideas or values or being confronted with information that contradicts these. Learning by definition challenges pre-existing knowledge, which explains why it is often felt to be so hard for adults and much less so for children who are unencumbered by preconceived notions. Because criticism is painful, it often evokes resistance. Still, I see no alternative to insisting on universal analytical tools, common performance standards and the ascription of responsibility where it belongs. Resistance to such criticism is not limited to members of underperforming societies, but equally unpopular in some parts of Western polite post-colonial discourse. Much of that discourse denies the progressive narrative of modernity as really only a cover for the total institutions of modern life with its prisons, mental hospitals, intelligence services and whatnot. According to these critics, the ambivalent nature of the modern state denies the possibility of any sort of freedom, either outside these institutions or within the cracks left between them. Postmodernism's more provocative challenge to liberalism and the constitutional state, ultimately to the idea of democracy and the rule of law, stems from its rejection of the emancipatory claims of the Enlightenment. Postmodernists argue that the constitutional orders that were built on enlightened premises are by no means more liberal, more civilized, inclusive or caring, but simply produce more subtle, more effective and productive technologies of subjection. In other words, because the modern state is at best a highly ambiguous achievement and because it is inherently impossible to compare, let alone rank different cultures, it would be chauvinistic and intellectually dishonest to describe the Arab state as failing vis-à-vis -vis its Western equivalent. This, it is argued, would be futile because no common normative standard of comparison can exist, because culture is always contingent and political communities therefore only understandable in their own context. The great American literary critic Marshall Berman dissects the position of Michel Foucault, perhaps the most prominent postmodernists, to arrive at a damning conclusion. He writes, After being subjected to this for a while, we realize that there is no freedom in Foucault's world because his language forms a seamless web, a cage far more airtight than anything Weber ever dreamed of, into which no life can break. The mystery is why so many of today's intellectuals seem to want to choke in there with him. Berman ventures a guess about the enduring attractiveness of postmodern fatalism and passivity. Their supposedly critical, ironic stance make it appear pointless to resist the oppressions and injustices of modern life and dream of liberation. But once we grasp the total futility of it all, at least we can relax. This sentiment is explored at length in a painful, difficult to read, but fantastic book by Guido Preparata, appropriately titled The Ideology of Tyranny, in which he has the following to say about the implications of this nihilistic school of thought. The proximate enemy of postmodernism appears to be technocratic oppression and surveillance, symbolized by the clean-shaven monitoring engineer in a white robe. But the ultimate target is unmistakably the belief in the good. Foucault's is a testimony to reasoned despair which strives to oppose compassionate sentiment and which takes no pains to reform the world's iniquities for the sake of peace. Preparata stresses that postmodernism proudly celebrates the absence of a political agenda or plan of reform. The idea of resistance to the alleged oppression of modern life that its adherents advocate is to celebrate the forces of resentment that fester at the margins of society and to join forces with them in undermining the constituted authorities. The celebration of transgressing established norms of decency appear to have been an end in itself, namely to keep social tension simmering. Not surprisingly, 
this school of thought has shown a remarkable affinity for political Islam in its most atavistic manifestations. From Foucault's enthusiastic visit to Iran at the height of the 1978 revolution, to Jean Baudrillard's characterization of the attacks of 11 September 2001 as both the high point of the spectacle and the purest type of defiance, which therefore could be forgiven, to contemporary apologetics of vile Islamist violence as somehow justified by the unfairness of an international system skewed towards Western interests. What is surprising is the intellectual affinity and cross-referencing between postmodern and Islamist thought, manifested not least in their mutual insistence on cultural relativism. These links are explored in a great book by Janet Afri and Kevin Anderson, Foucault and the Iranian Revolution, in which they examine the perplexing affinity between this post-structuralist philosopher, this European critic of modernity, and the anti-modernist Islamist radicals on the streets of Iran. Both were searching for a new form of political spirituality as a counter-discourse to a thoroughly materialistic world. Both clung to idealized notions of pre-modern social orders. Both were disdainful of modern liberal judicial systems and both admired individuals who risked death in attempts to reach a more authentic experience. If the postmodern invitation to transgress appeared to have been an end in itself, because that movement rejects the very notion of a universal good, try to imagine what its exponents would have, have to say about the orgies of sexualized violence unleashed by Islamist armed groups today. Foucault's earlier pronouncements about child abuse and about the executions during the Iranian Revolution give us a fairly good indication what he would have had to say about Nigerian or Yazidi girls abducted as spoils of war. This position can be contrasted with one of normative solidarity, insistence on epistemological equality and the liberating potential of rational critique. In short, the non-cynical embrace of universal values and common standards of analysis.